Hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or night. It's me again, Fina, and today we'll be discussing, in brief, because this topic is so huge, the basics of public health research. This is the fourth episode of my series thus far, and I want to thank each and every one of you for joining me this far and coming on this journey with me. It has been awesome. Now, without further ado, how about we just jump right into things? Healthcare research is a topic that could very well take up an entire series of videos, or an entire semester's worth of a college class. I should know, I took one. And I won't lie, that class was a little dry, but I'll attempt to make this video seem a little more engaging and impactful. Moving forward, there are two primary types of research, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative research is concerned with collecting data of primarily non-numerical origin. This can include interviewing participants, taking surveys, polls, measuring the emotional impact of an event on a subject, etc. For example, if after an earthquake you were to interview a family friend who had a first-hand account of the disaster and knew a victim of the tragedy, you could collect their account of how they're coping in the aftermath. Whereas if you were doing quantitative research, you would want to know how many people died in the earthquake, when, where, etc. So hard numbers and descriptive facts. Quantitative research concerns itself more with descriptive versus prescriptive or normative claims and facts. Numbers, data points, trends, demographics, etc. Which is why it contains the phrase quant, like the beginning of quantity, how much. Now, we should cover what exactly a population is, which is very important to the field of biostatistics and epidemiology in particular, but also paramount to other public health fields, such as global health and environmental health and occupational safety. A population in this sense is the select group of study um, under the observation of a researcher. Usually, in order to obtain a better sample size and therefore a greater number of potentially accurate and applicable answers across a population or strata, we would like a high number of participants or objects of study. 1,000 is better than 100. Peer review is a very important thing in the research field of community health. Most scholarly journals that publish public health research do so by either publishing their work online or in print with varying degrees of accessibility to non-members or the general public. Now, the journal that we are going to be reading from today is the Journal of Public Health Research, or JFRES. It's spelled J-P-H-R-E-S, I'm just going to pronounce it as JFRES. <laughs> it's open access to the public, so all lay people can see the examples and navigate the site I will provide in the description and on screen. J-P-H-R-E-S. Org. According to the statement posted on the front page of the journal's website, quote, The Journal of Public Health Research publishes contributions from both the traditional disciplines of public health, including hygiene, epidemiology, health education, environmental health, occupational health, health policy, hospital management, health economics, law and ethics, as well as from the area of new healthcare fields, including social science, communication science, e-health and m-health philosophy, health technology assessment, genetics research implications, population mental health, gender and disparity issues, and global and migration related themes. In support of this approach, the Journal of Public Health Research strongly encourages the use of real multidisciplinary approaches and analyses in the manuscripts submitted to the journal. In addition to original research, systematic review, meta-analysis, meta-synthesis, and perspectives and debate articles, the Journal of Public Health Research publishes newsworthy brief reports, letters, and study protocols related to public health and public health management activities." End quote. Before proceeding any further, let's take a second and identify some key phrases that we've not encountered before. Systematic review is simply using all the available resources available in that particular research study 
to conduct an overall analysis of the given materials in concert with the evidence and data. A meta-analysis is the statistical analysis of many different research studies with the intent of comparing and analyzing all of them for integrity and to validate the efficacy of the data and methods. Finally, a metasynthesis is the qualitative equivalent of a meta-analysis, but instead of collating information together, it is to gain a broader understanding of the expressed phenomena in the qualitative study. Now that we've identified those key phrases, let's move on to exploring some examples from Jay Fress's online journal archives. I'd like to point out one that, whilst not a journal article, is an announcement calling for a coalition of public health experts to submit entries for the Transformational Approaches 2030 Agenda for World Sustainable Development Project. This project encompasses numerous issues we've discussed before, global health being the main umbrella, since the UN is involved, but ending systematic poverty, climate change monitoring, and enhancing job opportunity and social mobility for low, middle, and high income countries is included as well. This is a multinational scale effort and shows just how broad and high reaching public health is. 193 countries have pledged to be part of this after all. They're taking a multi-directional approach to tackling systematic health disparities, and in the article, the list is enumerated as such. Quote, the 17 goals put forth are, one, no poverty, two, zero hunger, three, good health and well-being, four, quality education, five, gender equality, six, clean water and sanitation, seven, affordable and clean energy. Eight, decent work and economic growth. Nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. 10, raise your voice against discrimination. 11, sustainable cities and communities. 12, responding to production and consumption. 13, climate action. 14, life below water. 15, life on land. 16, peace and justice and strong institutions. And 17, partnerships for the goals." End quote. Sustainability is one of the topic, topical research subjects in public health today. After all, environmental sustainability is a top priority in a world so affected by desertification, rainforest habitat loss for certain animal species, food insecurity, especially in the advent of COVID-19, rising sea levels, and excessive hydrocarbon gas emissions from large multinational businesses. So, on to our first study, entitled, The Emergence of Scholarly Literature on Physical Slash Social Distancing Related to Coronavirus, a Bibliometric Analysis. Already, we can see that this is a collaborative cross-cultural effort by researchers from both Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Here, we can see a few key phrases that are important to understand when doing your own research. Usually, in the beginning of a research paper or article, the researchers will outline how their study was designed and what methods were used. Databases are helpful sources to use when public access knowledge is required by scholars. And in this case, the database Scopus was used. The findings in this case were understood from a bibliometric point of view, which simply means we are looking at literature as our metric for analysis. The goal of the study was to, quote, research productivity and its impacts on coronavirus related to physical slash social distancing, end quote. The research findings revealed, quote, the top four authors published their research in the year 2020. The study ranked uh, the British Medical Journal, BMJ, at the top position on publishing the research on the topic. Similarly, the U.S. took the lead in all countries in producing results and research on the topic. The researchers preferred the document type, article, for sharing their research, and a single authorship pattern was dominated on all other patterns." End quote. However, the study concludes that there were no existing studies found at the time of publication of COVID-related social distancing 
and that more research should be concluded and conducted in the future. Sometimes, research of funny enough will conclude that there should be more research done on the topic observed or tested, as is the case for this study. We don't always have a plethora of information on a single subject, so researchers who necessitate further study from the findings of their research are always valuable. I will note that, due to the date of this study being published May 19, 2021, Further research may have been conducted in this area and new developments have undoubtedly emerged in the study of physical and social distancing as it relates to COVID. Our next study comes to us in the form of the use of the health belief model to assess U.S. college students' perceptions of COVID-19 and adherence to preventative measures. This one is of particular interest to all those who are, were, or will be attending college during a time where the pandemic is still making international headlines daily. Now, before we go further, let me explain the health belief model to you guys. The health belief model is, well, a model, duh, <laughs> that measures a person's willingness to accept health interventions based on how threatening they feel an illness, disease, or condition is to them personally. In public health, we could apply this to, say, someone's willingness to drink and drive. How susceptible does the person think they are to drunk driving? Do they regularly engage in this? How bad do they perceive drinking and driving to be? If, prom if promoted or prompted with the option to drunk drive, is the person confident they could, in that case, call an Uber or walk home, for example? All of these factors, when generalized, make up the decision and the descriptive aspects of the HBM. Now, on to our study. In this study, also a collaboration between two people from different countries, these being the United States and Saudi Arabia, students from a large Midwestern university were examined using an online questionnaire sent to a random sample of 1,723 students. Now, here's where I quibble just a bit. Uh, for a large university, I would assume they would have sent it to more students. But we can take that into account when looking at the results. The questionnaire was sent between May and July of 2020. The results are as stated. Quote, results. The study found that the health belief model and perceived threat are significantly associated with COVID-19 preventative measures. College students with higher health belief model scores were more likely to adhere to COVID-19 preventative measures than those with lower scores. College students also reported high cues to action and low perceived barriers to most of the COVID-19 preventative measures." End quote. From this, we can conclude that public health measures are more effective when individuals have a higher HBM, that is, when individuals feel that a health concern is highly deadly something they are very susceptible to, something that would impact their daily lives, and is something that has a meaningful, accessible solution. Of course, not all these students had a high HBM score, but those that did understand and are more likely educated at least vaguely in public health prevention and harm reduction strategies, whether formally or informally, are the ones who are most likely to be affected by policies like COVID-19 preventative measures. Higher cues to action simply implies that, if given the opportunity, college students in this particular population, I would be wary of generalizing these results to the general college student demographic, disclaimer, would be more willing to take advantage of preventative measures without too much fuss or concern that X, Y, and Z would prevent them from doing so, which is a low perceived barrier. The study then concludes that their research shows it is paramount for healthcare professionals to apply the health belief model when creating and disseminating information related to COVID and in prevention of other future infectious disease outbreaks. As a footnote, please note that this information was published in July of 2021. Our final article tackles the complex subjects of childhood obesity, particularly childhood obesity in the face of COVID. This time, we see a medium-sized group of Indian researchers heading this particular study. 
This article is the most current of the three we've thus far seen, published in December 16th, 2021. In the background, the researchers emphasize that we've seen a large and rapid increase in the number of childhood obesity rates in low- and middle-income countries, but also in developed and high-income countries as well. Obesity has been a forefront issue in public health for a very long time, certainly as long as I've been alive. With COVID creating supply chain issues from top to bottom in even the most economically advantaged countries, as well as jacking up the prices of common food items and leaving a lot of people stranded at home in quarantine, it's no wonder more and more children face obesity. Poverty is another issue that the pandemic has only enhanced and highlighted. As children's parents or guardians are left without income to buy food and drink, they are left purchasing cheaper food items from fast food places or having to crunch money by not eating certain meals. Not being able to get a physical exercise by attending a school PE class, playing outside with kids in communal playgrounds, swimming in communal pools, doing after-school sports, etc., contributes to childhood obesity too. Finally, Stress, anxiety, and depression of parents might make it difficult for them to cook healthy and oftentimes time-consuming meals. Ergo, parents might opt for delivery dinners or frozen meals. According to the article, the methodology for this research was done, quote, using PubMed, Google Scholar, and Scopus databases for key terms, childhood obesity, obesity, pandemic, and or childhood obesity, end quote. Relevant articles were then collected and analyzed in the report. The results are, quote, the incidence of childhood obesity is analyzed from Bronfenbrenner's model of child development. The model examines an overabundance of bio, psycho, social background, risks, and probable outcomes on the development of a child. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the ecosystem of this dynamic model and has created an economic and socio-cultural crisis that has ignited a chain reaction of stressors upon children and their families." Quote. The authors further go on to say that using this model can be beneficial to addressing and preventing childhood obesity. I'll be honest. Dear viewers, I have no idea what Bronfenbrenner's model is, so I went and looked it up. Basically, the short version is that it's what I said before. Sociocultural environmental systems on their own and interacting with one another can cause childhood development, in this case obesity, to change based on certain factors. It's intersectionality, to put it in a single word. The conclusion is obvious. Using the Bronfenbrenner's theory, Healthcare workers and families of children with childhood obesity can tackle the core roots of obesity, viewing it as a product of not only internal but external factors. In public health, it is important to understand that the intersection of psychosocial stressors and methodology utilized to properly combat them is very much a, something that we have been developing and continue to use every day. We cannot eliminate childhood obesity or even begin to address it in a meaningful way if we do not tackle the roots of systemic equity disparities, racism, poverty, ableism, food insecurity, COVID-19 related trauma, etc. This is a global health issue to the core. Oh my god, that was a long one. We finally reached the conclusion of this episode. <laughs> As always, studies will be linked in the description. By the way, if you're not familiar with the style of citation and how to get to the link from the sources I provided, just copy-paste the part of the citation that starts with DOI. That should take you to the proper page where you can download a PDF of the study. As an additional bonus, I've included a fourth study in the description that I couldn't get to today in case anyone wanted to take a peek at it. Thank you all so much for watching. Peace out.